Hello and welcome to this episode of How to Be a Great GM. Well, in today's episode, as per a request on the channel in one of the comments, we're looking at how to create cities and how to make them unique in your world. Now, behind me, you can see I've got this map of Braxia hanging up here. And Braxia, of course, is the fantasy world that I have created over many, many years with the aid of my players running around and exploring it. Now, Braxia features hundreds of cities. I think at last count, there were about 123 of them. And each one of those cities is as unique as the rest. So how do you make cities unique within your own personal campaign setting? And how do you make cities and existing modules that much more interesting? Now, every city that you would visit here on Earth, or almost every city anyway, is different from the next. And there are many factors which make up that difference. Architecturally, geographically, the people who populated all kinds of things. So I've jotted down the five areas that I look at when developing a city or when developing a city on the fly. Because oftentimes my PCs will walk into a city and go, we're going there, Rorestag. What happens in Rorestag? I don't know. I've never been to Rorestag before. It's a big world and my players just never got there. So how do I make Rorestag as different from, say, Kintdar? or Berlegsteg, perhaps? How do I make those cities different from one another? Or even if I go all the way over here, Guchtoloch, how do I make that different from the other ones? So it's all about looking at things, and the very first thing I look at is what was the reason for the city in the first place? What was the reason for the city? Now, cities generally start off as villages, which slowly grow up into little towns. And then one day they go to graduation ceremony and they get turned into a city. And then eventually they get turned into a megatropolis, megalopolis, mega city, whatever you want to call it. One day they grow up to become one of those things. But generally speaking, cities are vast spaces that contain a significant portion of the population. Now, this, of course, is entirely up to you as to how many it contains, but generally it's 100,000 or more. At least that's what I remember reading once very long ago. So you look at the reason for the city. Was the city designed to supply something? Is it a breadbasket city? Do they grow crops around the city? Do they fish a lot? Do they mine? Do they have timber? What resource does the city supply, if any? Because the city that supplies something is only one type of city. There are many other types, which I'll go through shortly. So what is the supply of the city? And does it supply anything? If it does supply something, then the cities usually are skewed towards that. So there are cities where logging has always been important, and the logging was done on a river. So there's large amounts of docks for logs to dock at, and sawmills close to the rivers, and the mentality of the people is that the river is the lifeblood and without it they wouldn't survive. Same goes for people who are uh, heavily involved in fishing on those rivers. Coastal cities have a very strong uh, ocean-based focus depending on whether they supply magnificent catches of fish or not. There are plenty of coastal cities who have nothing to do with fishing and there are reasons for that as well. So does it supply something? Was it a midpoint? So there are cities such as, say, uh, here, Sangshas, if you can just see it at the top of the picture, which is right in the middle of the country and is right between Sahas in the north and Shatshatha in the south. So Shatshatha <laughs> in the south is traveling north, arguably, and Shangshas is just in the middle. It's a midpoint. It doesn't supply anything. It doesn't have vast resources that it can generate. The only thing it can supply is water en route, as well as bedding and accommodation. So it becomes more of a resupply resort space than a industry-based space. 
And that's a very big differentiator. If you think of certain cities, and I can think of many within South Africa, that grew up to be a midpoint on a long journey, and now those journeys are no longer taking long because of highways and flying and that sort of thing, those towns, those cities have devolved down into towns. And their prospects of once being these mega spaces have faded into history. And they have now become these little spaces where people carry out their lives in a fairly mundane fashion and continue to do so uh, as opposed to growing and that kind of thing. So is it a midpoint? Is it something that developed at a crossroads and it's just where people, there was an inn that started it and then the inn slowly spurned more little communities around a blacksmith suddenly set up shop and then a seamstress and then suddenly there's a church that's been built and, 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 and. So the evolution of the city is based generally on its function. Then finally, there are some cities, and predominantly in the medieval kind of setting, there are some cities that are purely built for defense. Now, unfortunately, on this particular map, you can't see all the way across to Braxia up here, this continent that's lost in the folds. But right there, where my finger is, there is a castle known as Grafen Keep which straddles a mountain range from one side of the continent to the other. Grathen Keep was built as a choke point. It defends the, the pass, quite literally. But over time, a community started to grow. Blacksmiths were needed. Fletchers were needed. Cartwrights were needed. All kinds of people were needed, and they all needed loving and caring for and religion and study, etc., etc. So those, for me, are the three areas I look for. Was it built for supply? Was it built for defense? Or was it built as a midpoint? And that will help to determine the character of the town. Is it an industrious town? Is it a defensive town? Or is it an enjoyment town, basically? A place of respite, a place of merriment, and a place of shelter from the dark. Now, another thing to look at, and you could argue that these things are interchangeable in terms of order, and they are, one inspires the other, is geography. What is the geography? Say, if we look here, we've got phenomenal mountain ranges, all capped in snow over here. We've got forests over here. This island is just forest. There's no mountains whatsoever. Over here, there's a volcano, as well as over here, we've got light plains with a nice big river flowing through it. I don't know if you can see that. As well as then lots of fractured little islands. If we move over, of course, we get to the Dwarvish territories. Uh, in my world anyway, and that's very few mountains, lots of plains, lots of forests, lots of very big rivers. How does that geography impact the city? Well, a city that's in the sand is a very different type of city to the one that is obviously in a plain. The one that's in a forest is different to one that's in a mountain. And how those are different is entirely up to you. Although mountainous cities tend to have more staircases, Plain cities tend to be more sprawling, simply because they have the room with which to expand. Desert cities tend to be more closed in, so that the sand doesn't get in. And of course, snow cities tend to be clustered together and very, very dome-like, so that the wind blows over it and all the heat is kept inside. Uh, that kind of idea. And of course, forest cities either are consuming the forest or are built into the forest, in which case, their scale is lost amongst the trees, and they start to work up the trees rather than away from each other, for, again, for various reasons. A safe city, a defensive city, of course, is going to have a major dominating keep over the whole thing uh, that looks down with city walls, perhaps. A trading city, a merriment city, might not have walls because, well, why would you want to attack? You come for dinner and rest. And, of course, the um, supply cities might originally have had a keep built somewhere to protect the flock or the grain or whatever it is, but have grown so large with the number of workers that are required for supply, etc., etc., that they are sprawling. So we're getting some very interesting imagery here. So I like to use the geography to help me to envisage the town. So its purpose, supply, defense, etc., it gives me the, the, the style of the town, if you like, then the geography helps to inspire me so that I can see the city in my mind. Because that always helps me when I'm describing it to my players. If I can close my eyes and physically see the city set amongst the mountains, and I'm sort of thinking of maybe a Nepalese type structure, Nepal and, and those monks building into the sides there of the, the Himalayas and things, 
I start to be able to describe it in that manner, and it makes life a lot easier than trying to come up with something from a ground level. Now, geography also talks to what resources are available. Now, if we uh, say, look at the dwarves, for example, is uh, the dwarves, for example, there's very little mountain range, so that implies perhaps that stone might be a problem over here. Mm backwards map, um, that stone might be a problem. There's lots of wood, so maybe the dwarves focus for them to be using a lot of wood. The ones, of course, that are in the mountains will use more stone. And that goes for almost all races. As a multi-species world, even as a singular species world, we use whatever resources are available to construct our buildings. Now, it is the rare occasion that we will import materials from hundreds of miles away, but generally speaking, we use the local resources. If there's lots of stone, we use stone. If there's lots of wood, we use wood. If there's not a lot of stone or wood, we use wattle and daub or thatch, mud, those kind of things to construct our buildings. So it's a mother of necessity. Necessity is the mother of all invention. Another thing to look at in terms of geography is the labor that is available. Now, if there's slavery, then that problem is to a large degree solved. But generally speaking, one must look at the local natives and go, well, this area is very heavily populated. Fantastic. So how and where do those people live? And what kind of labor do they contribute to this city? What do they live off of? If you have this major city in the middle of a completely deserted space, where does the food come from to feed all of those people? Where do the resources come from? So that's an important question in terms of geography. This city that I can never pronounce, Shang, uh, Sangshas, where does its supply come from? Where does all of the food come from? It's surrounded by desert, completely surrounded by desert, in all directions for at least 500 miles in every direction. There's nothing there. So that becomes a central focus of the city. It also allows you as the GM to then have supply problems. So the city starts starving. Maybe it starts getting covered up by sand, who knows? The geography can lead you down many, many paths. The ruling lord or lady of the city, what is she like? Is she benevolent? Is she malevolent? Is she greedy? Is she for the people? Is she against the people? Is she part of the community or aloof? Where does the lord of the city, where do they feature within this space? And that will help determine the mood of your city. If the Lord is a gregarious individual who helps load hay wagons and is affable and approachable, that city is going to have a very different tone, a very different mood to one where the lady of the keep is aloof and has one visitor a year and allows her chamberlains and stewards and things to run around and organize and manage everything on her behalf. Alternatively, a lord who likes to go out hunting villages at night for sport is again going to generate a very different mood. So that's something to bear in mind. A very religious leader, for example, will ensure that there is a lot of religious uh, doctrine and space within the city and may favor priests over any other class. So the lord is very, very important to determine early on in your city design what their role is and how it will affect the mood of the city. The wealth of the city. Is the city rich? Is it surviving? Or is it starving? Is it struggling? Is it a poor city? Now again, this just helps to determine the feeling that the PCs get when they enter into town. It also allows you to determine whether those magical items that they're hunting down, whether the mundane items that they're hunting down are available. You walk into the city, the gates are in disrepair, there's mud everywhere, and a general malaise sits about the people. Hundreds flock to you as you walk in begging for bread, as they haven't eaten in days, and their cadaverous bodies can be seen all over the place. What little labor you can hear is the occasional bang of a blacksmith's hammer, though weak with hunger, and the sound of a lone horse being slaughtered for food. This is the city of Arkenmore. Very bleak, very, very bleak space. I haven't described the structures, the geography, the Lord's mentality. I've described the wealth of the city and what a different type of city it is to perhaps one 
where as you walk in, brightly coloured bunting hangs from the gatekeep, and the guards have all got garlands of flowers wreathed in their helmets. They smile and cheer at you, and as at many others, all flocking into the main gates of the city, which are flung open wide, allowing all kinds of traders and merchants to wander in freely. This is a place of merriment and mirth. Very, very different from Arkenmore. Whatever Arkenmore might be. So the wealth of the city is very, very important in determining the, the, the tone, the style, the feeling that one gets from arriving in the city and the importance that the PCs have. If they arrive with great amounts of gold and they start spending it everywhere, there is going to be a lot of news that these very rich people have arrived and are just freely spending cash. That means there's lots of people who are going to want to get that cash from them. In a rich city, well, no one cares if you're spending three or four gold. That's chump change in comparison to what the rest are spending. So yeah, you can get a low-class accommodation for that. Then something that I like to add in, and I think this is important, especially in science fiction kind of cities, but in general in most cities, I add in oddities. Now, oddities come in three different forms as far as I'm concerned. One is the physical, so structures, buildings. Is there a tower that floats upside down? Is there a bottomless pit? Is there an arena where gladiators fight dragons? What is the oddity about the city? What makes the city just that much different from any other city? The oddity of my home city here in Johannesburg is that we have more trees than anywhere else on Earth. As a matter of fact, there are more trees in the city than there are inhabitants by a very small number. We have over seven or eight million trees and a population that's just under that. Also, the trees that we have are jacaranda trees and there are over 70,000 of those scattered around the city and they blossom a phenomenal purple uh, at the beginning of September, somewhere around there. And that phenomenal purple blossom lasts for a month and then it drops onto the ground and becomes this ridiculously disgusting brown sludge which is as slippery as you can possibly imagine. And every year there are many, many, many people admitted to hospital for broken bits having slipped on the sludge of this brown flower which once was beautiful purple. So there is a blessing and there is a curse that comes with those particular trees. So that is an oddity of the city that one could use to describe the city in a certain way. That's a physical oddity. Another oddity might very well be a spiritual oddity in terms of the acts that the city commits. Does it periodically grab a person from the street and set them on fire in a public display of emotion? Does it have slaves? Does it abhor slaves? Does it like certain types of races but not others? Is there something going on? Is there festivals? Are there celebrations? Rome, for example, had a celebration for 118 days that lasted with gluttonous festivities and wine drinking and bacchanalian activity. What a wonderful place to be in. Well, depending on whether you like parties or not. So the idea of acts, physical acts, is something that could be an oddity. And then finally, one looks at the spiritual... That was a sort of a spiritual act, the act. Then one looks at legal acts. <laughs> legal act. At uh, acts, at laws. Are there some strange laws in place? Like you can't use a long sword in public, or you only eat with a fork, you never use a knife. Perhaps you only eat with your hands. Um, there's a culture that in the one city that I grew up in, using your hands to eat is considered the normal way and using a knife and fork is considered the most bizarre thing on planet Earth. And they thoroughly encouraged me to try and use my hands. It was a custom that I just couldn't get used to, so I had to stick with a knife and fork. Anyway, it is the idea of creating this uniqueness. Now, we haven't touched on many other aspects which will make your city unique. The people, for example. The elvish city as opposed to a drow city as opposed to a dwarvish city. Now we've all got preconceived ideas thanks to the plethora of uh, illustrations and computer games and books and movies and things that show us that dwarves have a squarish architecture. Elves generally seem to have this wooded type of ethereal architecture and humans have the medieval architecture that we're all used to. That won't help you in creating two different elvish cities. So the oddities allow you to separate an elvish city from another elvish city. For example, Quetlin, which is over here. No, it's just, just the tip there, Quetlin. Quetlin. That elvish city is known as the City of Secrets. 
and is built in traditional Elvish style. There are a series, I think it's five uh, towers that are circumnavigate a central tower in which lives the Dawei. The Dawei is the ruler of the city within my Elvish space. The Dawei overlooks the other five, and the other five are the houses that are responsible for different aspects of the city. But within the city itself, there are multitudes of races and peoples going about their business. And there's a harbor that runs right into the center of the city and then allows everyone to distribute out. That actually sits underneath the tower of the Dawei so that he can look down over the ships and ensure that what is happening is all legal and above board. However, secrets are the preference in terms of currency within the city of Quetlin. Those secrets have very little value outside of Quetlin, but within Quetlin, the houses all want to know what the other houses are doing, and there's all sorts of wonderful, wonderful exchanges. Oh, I'll give you five silver if you tell me what that chambermaid emptied out this morning. I'd like to know. It speaks to the health of the occupant, doesn't it? And those kind of secrets and everything else that goes with it. And of course, there's a vast underground network. And subsequently, my players discovered that there was an entombed silver dragon beneath the city that was being used by the Dawei as a source of information and that kind of thing. What that determined was that every building that you walked into had all kinds of magical spells cast upon it, zones of truth, true seeing, all that kind of stuff, to make sure that there weren't that many secrets on the person asking questions uh, as well as the person answering them. That's an oddity to me, and that's what makes it unique from, say, another city, uh, such as, let's say here, Daythwin. Daythwin, we know, supplies most of the fish to the Elvish Empire, and as a result has a strong fishing focus, but it is also the South Sea's harbour for the Elvish Navy, and as a result there's a strong presence there of the military of the uh, Empire of Athen Vasul, my Elvish Empire. Anyway, I hope this has given you some insight into how to create cities even on the fly that have got a unique personality by just looking at those five different little categories and answering one or two questions from each or just one or two questions from one category will give you sufficient information to create a rather unique space and of course drawing on your own experience as to the cities and villages and towns and things that you have visited. Now, of course, this also propagates down into villages and towns. They're just on a much smaller scale, and you don't necessarily need to answer all of those questions. Villages might just be there because they tend the fields, and as a result, this small little community has grown up. But they will still have their own little oddities. Every village that I've ever visited, regardless of just how small or how big it is, has got something that makes it odd to the rest of the world. Until next time, I wish you and yours the happiest of gaming.